mission statement here at Calvary. We do all we can so all may know God's love and follow Jesus. That's burning in our hearts, and we've been doing this for 60-some years. And I got to tell you this. Uh, I got to share this story with you that I got from a friend after last, last week on Sunday. He sent me a text message. I asked permission if I could read it. He said, sure, go ahead. This is what he sent me. He said, I wanted to let you know how great the message was today. I needed to hear it. I needed to recheck myself on how to spread God's word. Listen to this. These, these are humble words from him. I haven't listened lately when God nudges me to talk to people. Well, I was able to do it today after church. I need to rent a suit for the girls' ministry ceremony. Uh, his daughter is in our girls' ministry. She's getting ready to be uh, awarded the highest uh, achievement you could get for her virtues, her character, her accomplishments. And she's going to get a crown, which is really cool. Well, the young guy measuring me for the suit was asking what the ceremony was. I told him what she was learning and doing. And it blew his mind that she was being rewarded for what she was learning. I told him she is being rewarded even more than just jewelry. She learned that she will have eternal life in heaven with God. He said, God doesn't want him in heaven because he, he's done some stupid stuff. So this is what this guy is saying to my friend. He, I, God doesn't want me in heaven. So my friend told him, we've all done stupid stuff. And I said, it's simple. Believe in him and ask for forgiveness. You will be changed he asked if he could come to the ceremony. I said, of course. I also gave him an invite to the Easter production. He was very excited. He asked if he could call if needed. I said, of course. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Praise God. What I love is that last part. He said, I could call if I needed him. He gave his number out to this gentleman to keep that connection going. I mean, if there's anything I want you to take today on a practical level, it's that. That we're not just going to go out and share and then leave people on their own to figure things out. But that we will do, sometimes we have to when we're on a plane or on a bus and we only, we only can see that person one time in life. We got to hit them with the whole message of Jesus Christ, right? And then pray that God does the rest and that they find someone wherever they go next. But I want to say this today, please take away today that we build relationships and a bridge of connection with the people we're ministering to. And when we bring people to the play, be ready to bring people that we're willing to also come alongside with after the play. Because when they give their life to Christ, they need someone to teach them how to follow Jesus. That is what Jesus called us to do. Again, I'm jumping ahead. Let me get to our scripture. Mark chapter 6. Let's go to Mark chapter 6 today. Our world has needs. And we get to meet them when we do all we can, and we do what we can, we can help meet the needs of our world. Mark chapter six, verse 30. John six also tells the story of feeding 5,000. I'm gonna use Mark six, he gets, he gets into some really nice detail. But there is one thing that John adds to it, I'll say later. So let's read this together. Mark chapter or six, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus from the ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Wow. Question, right? We'd have to work for months to earn money and enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, John 6, 9 says that it was a young little boy who brought forth a basket, five loaves of bread and two fish. This is, that's the perspective John had. This is a perspective in the book of Mark. Then they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread, two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. 
They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish, a total of 5,000 men and their families. So that means possibly around 15,000 to 20,000 people. Because in, in biblical times, the, the consensus was based on a man, and then they didn't add their family members or wives. So there was more than 5,000 were fed from those loaves. Wow. We see from this scripture that uh, Jesus has the power to do miracles, don't we? That's an obvious lesson. Uh, we see also that Jesus teaches the disciples to have action with their compassion. That, you know, we should act upon what we feel. Not just feel and then do nothing about it, but act upon it. So he says, you feed them. And then he's, he's also testing them too. He, he was testing Philip in John 6. He was testing them to see what they would do in the situation. We see too that Jesus relies on God to minister to people. Even Jesus blesses this food and prays. So he's teaching us to also rely on God as we minister to people. And then the, the lesson I really want to drive home today is when we give God what we can, God takes it and does more. When we give God what we can, God takes it and does more. He multiplies it. And you know what? It's so true. God does things that you never thought would be done with just one little act of kindness or, or one gift or one act of obedience and sacrifice. But here's something important to make, important point to make today. It'll be on your screen. Sharing the good news of Jesus doesn't start with a miracle. It starts with obedience and selfless generosity. Sharing the good news of Jesus doesn't start with a miracle. It starts with obedience and selfless generosity. It wasn't that they needed to perform this miracle. That's what Jesus decided to do. He needed someone to step forward and bring what they have. And it happened to be a little boy. Don't get me wrong. I believe that we can perform miracles with God. But I think sometimes we can look at this giant task and go, man, it's going to take a miracle. I can't do that. No, that's not what Jesus is asking. Jesus said, just go see what we have. And we have to do that too. We go, what do I have to offer? What do I have to give to help the lost and the unsaved, unchristian world? And then bring it forward. What God is looking for is obedience. What God is looking for is, is selfless generosity. But just like this, this man, uh, just like the disciples um, really going, hey, I don't know if I, we could do this. It would take months to make the money up for this. Some things can hold us back. For them, it was going to be this impossible task of feeding 5,000 people. But Jesus fixed that with just one little gift from a little boy. So what could be holding us back? Can I get a little real today? Is that okay? Is that all right? And I always do this looking at myself first, right? You guys know that. Um, but here's some things we may say to ourselves, and Satan loves it when we do this, by the way. He loves it when we come up with reasons not to help out and not to do what we can. And so I'm kind of trying to give him a black eye today, you know what I mean? And try to put him in his place and just, just encourage you all that we don't have to say these things, we don't have to believe these things that we can believe differently. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. I'm also very thirsty again today. <laughs> Keep drinking that water. Number one, the task is too great for me to make a difference. That's what we'll say sometimes. There's this African proverb that says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, try spending the night in a closed room with a mosquito. <laughs> it's very true. I've been on ranger campouts, waking up with a lot of mosquito bites. And Richard Stern said this. He's the president of World Vision. He said, God never asks us to give what we do not have, but he cannot use what we will not give. And he has helped change the world with his team to feed millions of lives, feed millions of kids. The task is too great for me to make a difference. It's not. If, if we do what we can and everyone does what we can, we can make a difference together as we see in Scripture over and over again and in this story here. Listen to this story from, uh, about a man named Edward Kimball. There's a true story of a young man from Boston by the name of Edward Kimball. Kimball taught Sunday school at his church because he felt called to invest in the lives of young boys and men. 
Now, Sunday school is where, just in case you're new, like churches have kind of gotten away from Sunday school, but Sunday school is where you would go to a class before the church service. And we have that during the nine o'clock service. We, we call them community groups and they meet in the classrooms here. And so they learn and go deeper. So he's, he's committed himself to investing in boys on a weekly basis. Now, to get to know his students better, he would often visit them during the week where they lived or worked. One, one Sunday, a challenging teenager showed up in his class. The boy was 17, a bit rough, poorly educated, and prone to outbursts of anger and profanity. Edward, I love how Edward, I love how Edward didn't avoid him because of that. Listen to this. Edward thought about how he might reach this boy and one day decided to visit him at the shoe store. Edward Kimball passed by the store once, trying to get up the courage to speak to the boy. Finally, he entered and found the boy in the back, wrapping shoes and putting them on the shelves. Edward went to him, simply put his hand on the young man's shoulder and mumbled some words about Christ's love for him. His timing was just right, because right there in the store that day, the boy was moved to commit his life to Christ, and his name was Dwight L. Moody. Amen. And he became the most successful evangelist of the 19th century, preaching to an estimated 100 million people during his lifetime and traveling perhaps a million miles before the time of radio, before the time of television, automobiles, and air travel. And it doesn't stop there. Moody helped lead F.B. Meyer to God in 1879, who later became a minister. Meyer mentored J.W. Chapman and led him to Christ. Chapman started an outreach ministry to professional baseball players, and Billy Sunday became a Chapman's assistant. Billy Sunday started his own evangelism ministry and became the greatest evangelist in the first decades of the 20th century. Mordecai Ham, a product of Billy Sunday's ministry, came back to Charlotte to hold a series of evangelistic meetings. On one of the final nights when Ham was preaching, a gangly teenager came forward and responded to his call to give his life to Christ. His name was Billy Graham. Whenever you feel like you've done nothing worthwhile to offer, remember Edward Kimball. Edward never did anything spectacular or particular pr- newsworthy, particularly newsworthy. He just showed up out of the faithfulness to God an hour or two a week to teach the boys in his class. And yet this dedication led to a group of boys changing the world. Isn't that awesome? He committed himself. He's willing to invest in lives, spend time with them, help them understand. He's willing to go beyond. He's willing to love on someone that maybe was a little unlovable to show the love of Christ to this young boy. And it was D.L. Moody who led to eventually even Billy Graham, who has reached millions as well. Number two, maybe we feel like we're going to fail. Maybe we say, I'm going to fail. I'm so glad that Abraham Lincoln didn't stop. This is what he said. The probability that we may fail in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. I believe in what we're doing to reach souls here at Calvary. And no matter what tries to come against us, we will continue to persevere and push through and push through and reach people. You know, we can't really fail if we haven't even tried. You know what I mean? We have to try. And I'd rather fail and mess it up when I'm trying to obey a commandment of Jesus than, than never try. That's how I've always taken it. That's how I've always lived my life. Number three, I don't think they will listen. Maybe sometimes we've said, I don't, I don't think they'll listen. We assume that they won't listen or care or, or don't need what we have to say. I just, I just read an article from Tom Rainer. He's one of the leading researchers for Christianity. He said that people are, are actually wanting us to invite them to church. That the unbelieving, non-Christian world is actually waiting for us to invite them. That they're actually eager to learn and hear the truth. Not all of them, but they're out there. And that they're actually likely to come with you if you'd be willing to invite So instead of assuming that people won't care or won't listen or won't want to come, let's not do that. There's only one thing we should assume is that they need Jesus Christ. I mean, I've been guilty sometimes of seeing people who have a health, they're healthy, they're wealthy looking, they're happy. But even them, even those people like that actually still need Jesus or they're still in debt spiritually. So we can't look at the outer shell and think that they're all good. We have to think about how we can minister and reach out to them as well. Number four, I don't have time. 
I think eternity is the time we should probably be concerned about. And it's time to synchronize our watches, you know, synchronize our lives and our agendas to the life of Jesus. We just, we just worship a beautiful song. And I love how Rachel challenged us to really mean what we're singing, to build our lives on Jesus. And when we start building our lives on Jesus and following him, we find out that he spends a lot of time loving people. He spends a lot of time hanging out with people. And that's the kind of life I want to live because one day I'm going to have to live with someone for eternity or watch someone else not live with me for eternity and go to hell. And so I'd rather give my all right here, right now on this earth that is so quick, it's like a mist, so that people can go to be with God forever than for them to miss out. We have time. Number five, I don't have a very good reputation. You might be right about that. Maybe your old life will throw some people off, but your new life draws people in. Yes, our old lives might be a little hard to believe. It might be hard for someone to believe that they're changed. I, I've heard stories of people saying, I don't know, man, I have a bad reputation. My old life was bad. That's the power in your story. The power in your story is you're not like that person anymore. And yeah, maybe you need a season to grow. Maybe you need to be in a community group to grow and overcome some things so you can go back and be a more credible witness of the cross of Christ and what he's done in your life. That's, that might be true, but don't let your old life stop you from helping bring new people in. Let them see how you've been changed by Jesus. Do not let Satan cause you to think that way. God wants to use you, even the messes of your life. He'll use the scars and the stories of your past because now you're a new person, a new creation. Number six, I'm not worthy. Very similar to number five. I've heard this before. I'm not worthy. We weren't worthy to be saved, but Jesus still saved us. It's not about whether we're worthy or not. It's about whether we're willing or not. It's not a worthiness. It's a willingness. Listen, Jesus uses people you would never expect. Have you seen the resume of the disciples recently? Have you read their lives in the gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Check it out. They had some problems. Like I said, Peter denied Jesus three times. He forsake, he forsook Jesus. And the most important time that he should have been there for Jesus, he ran away hiding and Jesus restored him when he returned. But think about that. I mean, Peter's the one that slashed someone's ear off, got violent, Almost killed a guy. And yet, after the resurrection, Jesus is out preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, a a transformed life. It's proof that God uses rough people too. It's not perfect. We're not perfect. But we're growing and maturing over time. And, And lastly, we may say, I have no experience. You're right. Maybe we don't have experience, but we start somewhere. We start getting a suit tailored and just connect the dot for someone. I love how Josh did that. He took, he took this moment. It was the Holy Spirit working through my friend Josh in this story with his daughter. But he, he took a moment to connect the dot with his daughter's, his daughter's award to eternal life with this gentleman. It was such a cool way of connecting it. And you know what? It's not something he does all the time. He's still learning how to do it as well. The reason why I'm encouraged that we can do this, even if we don't have a lot of experience, is because what an unbeliever needs isn't rocket science. So I want to take you through a list of things. I realize you have a lot of fill-ins today. I'm sorry if this is too much, but I just wanted you to have some practical things to help you minister this week. Because we learned in the story of the 5,000 that sometimes we have to meet people's basic needs, right? Spiritually, Jesus was teaching, and then physically, they fed Uh, Jesus and the disciples fed the people. Maybe this week you will need to serve someone or help someone out with some physical need. I know we've been watching our, our neighbor's kids here and there to build a connection. Maybe it's a random act of kindness. Maybe it's purchasing coffee for the person staying behind you, whatever it may be. Those are little things you can do to start a connection. Or as our friend who was getting his suit tailored, he found a way to connect Christ to that situation. There's that. But can I go a little deeper? Please, permission to go a little deeper. Um, 
our lost and dying world kind of just needs friends that would be there for them. They need a connection, a personal connection. And I really feel like the following list is, is something we really need to try. And I realize that that might mean your time has to change or other things. But I'm just praying that we'll rise up and do this so that all may know. That we'll do all we can. So maybe today, this is what you can do. Because here's the thing. These, this list is actually not that hard. We already practice it with our own family and friends. So here's number one. Number one, they need someone to be available. This is, this is going to seem so simple, but it's so true. Our unbelieving, non-Christian world is looking for someone to just be available. To be present and free to spend quality time. Number two, they need someone who's going to be gracious and patient because, uh, well, they're not saved yet. So they may, they may cuss a little bit. They may make some poor choices. They may post some things online that they probably shouldn't post. That's because they haven't met Jesus Christ yet. And if you're in here today and you're trying to figure out how do I grow from my old life, and, and I want to I want to encourage you right now uh, to focus on Jesus more than behavior modification. Okay, Jesus changes your heart and mind, so therefore it changes your speech, it changes your actions. And I preached a message series called Jesus First. It's on our YouTube channel. If you want to go to it at Calvary Dover, check out that series because it was so pivotal for this year that we do everything through the lens of Jesus first. And we don't come to Jesus and fix ourselves first to get to Jesus. We come to Jesus broken and messed up and then he fixes us. And this is what we need to realize today, that we're going we're gonna to come across some people who don't have it all together, and we got to be patient and gracious with them. Amen? Number three is similar. We have to be empathetic. We have to show empathy. We have to consider where they've come from and what they've been through. You know, some people have actually been hurt by Christianity, and not necessarily Christianity, but Christians. Because we're not perfect people either, are we? And sometimes we have had bad days. And sometimes we haven't represented Christ right. So sometimes we have to sit back. This comes from a question I had at my community group Friday night. How do we reach someone who's backslidden or is kind of hurt with, about God or hurting because of a death in their family and they're struggling with, uh, with God on that? You know, we have to be empathetic and hear what's going on in their lives before we rush to fixing them. You know what I mean? Number four, we need to be relatable. We can't speak like Christian alien language, you know? Like someone has to walk around with a Christian dictionary. What does that word mean? We have to be relatable and understandable. So sometimes we have to help explain what biblical things mean and what Christ-like things mean. And uh, I'm just grateful that you all come in here and just hear us out and listen to us. Some of you are maybe new to the faith and, you know, don't be afraid to ask us what things mean. Don't be embarrassed to do that or humiliated to do that. Um, we just recently had someone ask, like, how do they search through the Bible? You know, we don't want anyone to be embarrassed by that. But just so you know, there is a table of contents in the front to help you. Don't be embarrassed to use that. You don't have to be one of those pro Christians who go, oh yeah, I know where John is. It's right here. Yeah. You know? And you're like in the book of Habakkuk or something, you know? <laughs> it's okay. You don't, you don't have to put on a facade. It's okay. Speaking of that, number five is we need a safe, they need a safe place to question and process. Wow. Instead of, instead of being afraid to have doubts, let them have doubts and let them process these doubts with you. By the way, convince is going to address a lot of those things. The play. Be the kind of Christian that is not afraid of people doubting and questioning things. That is normal. That's part of life. In fact, I'd rather that we really dig in deeper than just believe blindly all the time. Because, by the way, there's a ton of facts for the Christian faith. There's a ton of verified evidence for the Christian faith. And you'll hear about that in the play as well. Number six is very similar as well. Answers and truth. Our unbelieving, non-Christian community needs answers, and they need you to be honest. And what I mean by that, too, is like, if you don't know the answers, you tell them, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. 
That's humble. That's humility. And that's us going back and studying, which is great. Number seven, they need us to be gentle, but not timid either. We don't want to be pushy trying to get someone to convert overnight. Hey, 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 you need to believe in Jesus right now. No, we need to let them process things. We need to let them, let them read the Bible for themselves and, and try to grasp what this all is all about. This is a big decision for people's lives. We should let them do that. But at the same time, when they're ready, we need to be ready to just help them go, I, I'm ready to believe in Christ. I'm ready to follow Jesus and then help them with that process. Number eight. And by the way, you can actually do that by just simply asking them, are you ready? Are you ready? Number eight is a person to call in time of need or trouble. A person to call in time of need or trouble. This happened this past week. A friend of mine, um, he said, can you pray for my coworker? He, his, his mother's in the hospital. She's not doing good. He's not a believer. Isn't that awesome that this guy knows to go to my friend in time of need? And the fact that he was available, ready to care, and then he's telling people that pray to pray, and that was awesome. And I'm praying that God has taken care of his mother and will work through this situation. Number nine, they're looking for someone to be an authentic example of the Christian faith. Right? Didn't you want that? Like, it's, it's one thing to be told how you're supposed to live. It's another to actually witness how you live. It's powerful to see the truth in action. And we get to show people what it looks like to be the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And not just say the gospel. So we need to be authentic examples. That's one of our core values here at Calvary is authenticity. We want to be real with you. And, and we want to be real with them up front. That we're not, we're not perfect. We don't have it all together. But I'll try to be an example for you the best I can. And number 10, ongoing connection and relationship. Just like Josh did, he shared the phone number with him and said, hey, give me a call anytime you want. Is there a way where you can continue that connection so that there's someone to go to? It really encompasses all of this. And number 11, lastly, is explain the gospel clearly, the good news of Jesus, and invite them to believe. Last week, I unpacked what the gospel is in my sermon. And you can go on YouTube as well and watch the first message of So All May Know so you can hear it. But if you're looking for a copy of the notes last week, we've had some people request that. Just go ahead and call the office this week. We'll take a list. We just need your email, and we will send you a copy of what the gospel is from what I read last week. Read it, study it, and get ready to share it in, not Christianese, right? Not Christian dialect, but in as much as possible, share it in layman's terms. Because even for me, sometimes it's hard to grasp it. And I've been raised in the church. You know what I like about this list? It's relational. And it's also circumstantial or situational. When a situation arises, we're there and we're helping. But I love this list because it's more about being the gospel than just saying the gospel. It's about being the good news for someone, showing Jesus in our lives instead of just talking about Jesus. In other words, out of this list, outside of Jesus, because Jesus is, there's no doubt, Jesus is the most important thing anyone needs. Outside of Jesus, a non-Christian's greatest need from us is us. Outside of Jesus, the greatest need they have is us. Because we know. We know Jesus. We've had a relationship with him. We have experience with him. And so we know. 